interviewing Mark. Mark uh, was born up there in Kentucky. I was kind of teasing him. We were going up to uh, uh, help Brother Martin do something in his church up there in Indiana. I said, Mark, I said, you know, I can tell we're getting close to Kentucky. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, you know how I can tell? I said, how? I said, I can smell it from here. <laughs> He didn't like that very much. <laughs> so we were coming back from uh, Indiana, you know, and Mark knew we were getting close to the Tennessee line. Mark said, you know, I can tell we're getting close to Tennessee. <laughs> I said, how can you tell? He's looking at his old raggedy shacks all the time. <laughs> well, he got back at I know he thought about that for the three days where we go. Just to, he was probably thinking, I'm going to get him. I just don't know how I'm going to do it. But I'm going to get him. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, good to see you all this morning. And uh, uh, I went down to visit with my brother. He lost his wife, uh, what, three weeks ago now. So that's about right. And then the next week he had to have a pretty serious surgery. And uh, so he was really, really down and uh, so I felt led to just go down and spend some time with him, just him and I, you know, and hash over old times and fix things that maybe, you know, misunderstandings that might have happened when we were kids and uh, so we had a good time together and everything, you know, and uh, mom always liked him best anyway, but, <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, uh, we, we passed up a few things, you know, and that I, that I felt like he had felt, you know, just being brothers and, and then later being involved in ministry, we were kind of going different directions a little bit and stuff and just different, uh, same gospel but just different, different applications, like the same spirit but different application of the gifts and stuff like that. And, but anyway, we had a, a good time and, and I think that he really enjoyed me coming with it, being, spending that time. Praise the Lord. But we're glad to be back. Glad to be back. Uh, this morning, I tell you, you know, I hope a lot of you are uh, reading your Bibles, and I hope you're progressing. And uh, I'm scheduled to read the Bible all the way through, both New Testament and Old Testament. By the end of the year, if you'll follow that little outline, you'll do it. You'll be surprised, but you will be able to do it. But anyway, uh, while reading in the Gospel of John, I noticed in one particular chapter, uh, the whole chapter deals with uh, unbelief and attitude. And I thought, well, that's amazing that the whole chapter is dealing with this situation uh, when, when Jesus performed this one miracle and spending a chapter there, and I think there's some lessons to be learned. So I thought I would just look at that chapter with you this morning and uh, let's see what the, we can dig out from this chapter that would help you and I. Uh, there was an old preacher one time said, he said, there's three classes of people in the world. He said, there was the believer, there was the unbeliever, and then again, there was the late believer. And he said, of all those three classes or types, there's the whole world. Believer, late believer, and unbeliever. And, and I, I agree with that to a, to a certain extent for that I actually believe that to be a late believer, you would have to be an unbeliever too. But a made believer is trying to believe in something or has fooled himself that he believes something when actually he doesn't. So that boils down to being an unbeliever. But uh, when I read this chapter through and then read it again, I thought, you know, uh, there's some things here that we need to look at ourselves. Because when Jesus performed miracles, I mean, you know, he, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he opened the blinded eyes. He unstopped the deaf ears. The lame walked. Uh, he provided the multitudes with just a few fishes and some loaves of bread. And I mean, he walked on water. I mean, he was a miracle working man. And I thought, Lord, if, if, if he were walking the, the, today and we seen this miracle, would we believe? <laughs> I mean, what would you and I believe if we had never believed and never seen a miracle? Would we believe that he was the Son of God? 
because of this miracle that he performed. I would like to say yes, that we all uh, would believe. But as I read through this, sometimes I, I, I wonder, I wonder. You know, it's like the children in the wilderness. You know, they see the fire by night and the cloud by day, followed them wherever they went. Uh, God rained down manna from heaven, yes. you know, every day for them to eat. And you'd think, if I was there and I'd see bread falling from heaven and a, and a pillar of fire at night leading the children of Israel and a cloud by day leading us, and when Moses struck a rock, water came out, and, you know, and all this stuff, I said, man, I'd be a believer. But, you know, they fell in the wilderness because of yes. their Unbelief. Yes, yes. They seen the miracle, but they really didn't see the miracle. Something blinded them. Yes. And that's how powerful unbelief is. It will actually blind you to reality of faith. Yes. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the Bible's definition of faith. Yes. That we hope for something, but yet we can hope for it, but faith materializes. Faith is substance. It's the substance of things hoped for, the, or the evidence of things not seen. So faith is when something actually happens. It appears. You can say, I have faith, but nothing ever happens. Guess what? You have hope. <laughs> you know, and that hope is not materialized into faith. So, but faith will bring things to pass. So I want us to have faith. Jesus and I have that scripture, and I, I, I probably won't read it, but Jesus, when he was among his own people, in his own land, there was his, uh, his brothers and sisters by Mary and Joseph were there. Uh, people that had known him were there. But the Bible says he could do no mighty works there. He couldn't do a miracle there because of their unbelief. So unbelief is something so powerful, and if we fail to deal with it, it's, we're going to succumb to it. It's going to rob us of things that God wants to do for us. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yes. So if faith stopped the move of God for the people that was in Christ, believe me, it'll stop you and it'll stop me. So we need to deal with it. You know, we need to be honest with one another. You know, it's a foolish thing to pray and ask God to forgive you for something when you don't really care if he does or not. By that, I mean you keep doing the same old thing. You're not really repenting. You're just sorry you did it. But we need to understand that, you know, God knows everything about us, children. He knows what's in our hearts. We cannot hide anything from God. So when you pray, be honest. I tell people, you know, people will say, well, teach us to pray. I say, well, talk to God just like you're talking to me. <laughs> I mean, that's the, I mean, what, you know, there's nothing hard about that. You don't have to use a lot of these and thou's, you know. You know? Jesus understands you if you just talk your talk. You don't have, Lord, thou's, no, thine hard, mine hard. You know, you know, just forget all that stuff. And just talk to the Lord. Just like you would talk to me or just like you would talk to your husband or to your wife. Well, maybe not that way, but I mean, you know, like you would talk to a friend. <laughs> Like you would talk to a friend or somebody that really loves you. Talk to the Lord that way because he loves you more than you know. Amen. He's the heavenly father. Don't never forget that. So when you talk to the Lord, be honest with God and say, God, I want to believe that I've got a little bit of a problem here. Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to believe. Increase my faith. Help me. Amen. Because I don't want to fall into the attitude that I find in this uh, chapter. It's found in John, St. John chapter 9, if you have your Bible. St. John chapter 9. Amen. And when you get there, say amen. I know you've arrived. We're going to read through this thing, and just I'm going to make a few comments here. Okay, and the outline of the, the story here is all about a man that Jesus granted a miracle of sight to a man that had been blind since he was born. He was born blind. Verse 1 says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, 
this man or his parents that he was born blind. So right away we see that the attitude of the people was if somebody was blind, they could have been crippled, they could have been deaf, they could have been, you know, had some kind of disease, that the attitude of the people of that time was they have sinned. Somebody had a sin, somebody's committed a sin, or this man would not be blind. That was their attitude. Somebody say attitude. Because we're really dealing with an attitude here. I mean, when you, when you look at unbelief and faith, and all, we're, we're really dealing with an attitude. What is your attitude toward God? Does God mean what he says? Or does he not mean what he says? So here we find right away that the attitude of the disciples and the people of that day was that if this man was born blind, somebody had to commit a sin. Was it him? Or was it his parents? Who did? Well, you know, why was it that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. Look at that word, should be manifest in him. That the works of God should be known in him. Amen? In other words, this man was blind from his birth for this purpose. His eyes was going to be opened. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. In other words, Jesus is foretelling a time when no miracles can be done, that no one can be saved. That's a horrible thought. I know that there is coming a time when grace will have ended. Even though his, endure, his mercy endureth forever, man is going to come to the place where God can no longer do anything for him. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. God was sick and tired of the condition of people as coming again. And then Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. Can you imagine here Jesus say, hey, you know, he's got the blind guy there and he's spitting. <laughs> You know, I come out of the Lowe's the other day, and I just had this feeling, you know. <laughs> and this sophisticated person was walking by, and you know, kind of looked disdainly at me. I'm glad Linda didn't see me, because she would have probably said something. But you know, when you got to spit, you got to spit. <laughs> Some of you ladies act like you never have spit in your whole life. I can remember my grandmother, she would spit this way. Yeah. She would spit. And she would have a big thing with Jay sitting on the floor. And I guarantee you, it would go right into the. No doubt she practiced a lot. And her spit was always brown in color. Anyway. I guess I'm kind of revealing how I was raised, so. But anyway, that's just the way it is, you know. You gotta spit. But Jesus spit on the ground. And not only did he spit on the ground, it must have been a pretty good bit of spit. Because he got down and he made him a little patty cake out of it. Now I might be reading between the lines just a little bit, but but it says that. He said he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So it's a strange to me, you know, why didn't he just say, eyes be open or, you know, pray and just touch him and all his eyes is open. But no, he spits on the ground, he makes him a little patty cake out of his spit with the mud that, that he's created out of the spit, and then the next thing, he goes and puts it on the guy's eyes. I can see the Pharisees standing by not only does he not wash his hands when he eats, look now what he's done. <laughs> look at this guy. I believe Jesus did this for them. I actually do. Because remember the time, and maybe in this past I can't remember, but there was the time, you know, where they, they, they accused Jesus, the disciples were eating before they washed their hands. Man, you, you guys didn't, they didn't even wash their hands. You know, Jesus says, not what goeth in a man that defiles it, what comes out of it. But anyway, there he is, you know. And I, I'm, I'm certain, I'm not certain, but I believe 
that that's why he did this. He knew the Pharisees were standing by, and he wanted them to see. He knew they wouldn't like it. That's what I like about Jesus. He didn't really care if you liked him or not, truly. But he was just going to do what he was going to do. Anyway. So then he anoints the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And then to further provoke, I believe, some of the people, he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. So what did man have to do? I mean, he had to obey the word that was given unto him. It wasn't just the spit on there. His eyes were still not open. He still did not see. And Jesus said, now I want you to go wash that off over there in that pool. The blind man was obedient to the word that Jesus spoke to him. So he went over there, and the Bible says, when he washed his eyes, he came seeing. In other words, he came back seeing. So that tells me that when he washed his eyes, he didn't see either. But when he came, he, he began to go forward or go to, back toward Jesus. He came seeing. He began to see because he had obeyed the word that God spoke to him. Say amen. amen. The next verse, he said, The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, now listen, the neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that was blind. These neighbors seen him that was blind. The others seen him that was blind. And they said, is not this he that sat and begged? In other words, ain't this the one that sat over there and begged? Ain't this the blind man? Ain't, him, ain't he the one? Some said, this is he. Others said, he kind of like him. He might be him. He looks like him. But he said, the blind man said, hey, I'm him. <laughs> Maybe that's kind of funny when you look at it, you know. Because the one says, See, well, you know, uh, 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 he's the one that made, well, I think, uh, maybe he is, but, and the other one, you know, is that, well, uh, uh, he's like him, but, uh, but, but the blind man said, hey, I'm him. I'm the one that was sitting over there. I'm the one that was begging because I was blind. This is me. I'm, I'm him. Therefore, they said unto him, How were thy eyes opened? How did this happen? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. And they said unto him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Now they're taking him to the, to the doctors of divinity. You know, they're taking him to the religious folk. They're taking him to the preachers, you know. And they, they said, well, now, uh, they, they bring the blind man to the, to the Pharisees, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he, he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Look, they're arguing about this. They just cannot believe that this guy had received his sight from this guy Jesus. They just could not believe it. You know, because they didn't believe, they thought because he healed this man on the Sabbath day, which in their minds, he broke the Sabbath day. He did something on the Sabbath day that he shouldn't do. So, so he, he's not only not a keeper of the Sabbath day, he's a sinner. So they said, well now, th this, this ain't, this, this is not true. This is not working. Even though, here's the blind man saying, I did see now. I mean, I couldn't see, but now I see. Okay, therefore, said some of the Sabbath, uh, Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keeps it not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him? That he hath opened thine eyes. He said, he's a prophet. 
I mean, the blind man got more sense than the doctors of divinity here. I think, you know what I'm saying? He said, hey, he's, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, them, saying, is this your son whom you say was born blind? In other words, is this your son whom you say was born blind? See, the doubt is here. Yes. See, the unbelief has set in. They, did, they were going to reject this no matter what. Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered and said, to answer them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He can speak for himself. Well, he done told them. They just ain't going to believe this. See, when unbelief sets in, Attitude begins. Yes. Denial is there. No matter what the facts are, you're going to fight against the facts. Yes. See what I'm saying? Listen. He said, he can speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ or Jesus was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. They're going to throw them out of the church. Mm -hmm. If they recognize that Jesus actually did it, they're going to be kicked out of the church. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be excommunicated. Yes. They're going to be, you know, set aside and everybody's going to laugh at them because they've been put out of the church. So they were afraid to say, you know, anything really about this other than what they had said. So therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again, call they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. <laughs> See, they were convinced that Jesus could not possibly do this because in their minds, he broke the Sabbath day. Yeah. You know, Jesus one time told them on a similar situation to this when he had healed the sick on the Sabbath day. He said, my father's working, so I am too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like saying, hey, stupid, God's the one that healed them. So, I mean, so he worked this work, so I'm working too. I'm doing what he's asking me to do. That's really what he was saying. So he said, ask of him, he's of age. He called the man that was blind, said to them, give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. He answered and said, now I want you to listen to the wisdom of this guy who is not, listen, he's not a doctor of divinity. He didn't go to Bible college. He, had, he, he really knows nothing much about, the, you know, he, he's just a young man that's born blind, but he's got a little bit of sense. He's not, he's not someone that's in unbelief. Hey, he was blind, now he sees, man. You can't, you, you know what I'm saying? There's no unbelief in this guy. He knows something supernatural happened to him. He had never seen before. So, you, you know, you're not, going to, you're not going to convince him that Jesus is a sinner. You know, and you're not going to convince him that he can't see when he can play and see. See what I'm saying? So he said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. What thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did, he, what did he to thee? In other words, what did he do? How, how did he open your eyes? He answered, he said, I have told you already, and you did not hear. I mean, it, you know, I'd be aggravated too. It's like he said, listen, you know, I'm tired of telling y'all, but it's, he, he said, he said, I've told you already, and you can, you can see the frustration, feel the frustration here. I've told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be a disciple? <laughs> oh, boy, he's rubbing it in now. See what I'm saying? He's rubbing it in. He said, hey, I've told you before now, if you want me to tell you again, 
would you be a disciple? Can you imagine? Well, these Pharisees, man, they are so far into unbelief. They have been overtaken with this. This is what he says. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing? This is the blind man that, that was blind, now he sees. And he's telling, he's preaching to them now. He said, Why therein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Man, he, he put the word on it. He said, man, if the world began. Everybody got any sense at all knows if a man opened another man's eyes that was born blind, he's from God. Amen. Only God is the creator. Praise God. And, they, and, and he's frustrated with these Pharisees. He's frustrated with them. He, he's upset with them. Like he's done told them two or three times, you know. Uh, he's given them a testimony. His mom and dad come up there. The neighbors around told him and everything. And now he's told them again. And he's frustrated. He's, well, maybe you'll be a disciple if I tell you again. He's the one. But they're not going to have it, children. They're just not going to have it. You know, it's a sad thing, but that's the way it is today. Listen, people want a miracle. They want to see a sign. But I'm going to tell you something. The Bible teaches us, amen, that God has put into every man the measure of faith. God has already put some faith in every single solitary human being. That is enough faith to believe him, to believe in God. Amen. You can walk out on a starlit night in the summertime where there's just millions and billions, actually billions of stars lighting the sky. And praise God, you see the handiwork of God all about you. You can go to the mountains. You can go to the seashore. You can see his creation everywhere. Everybody can see there is a God. Even though that it, with the Hubble telescope now and then, it seems further and further and further. And now they're finding out there is trillions of stars. There are actually billions of galaxies. Yes. It cannot be explained. And even the scientists have said, there had to be something that called this. And they call it the Big Bang. <laughs> I thought they go, oh, it's a Big Bang. You're a scientist. You got all kinds of degrees. And you got, the only thing you can come up with is it's a big bang. A six-year-old could come up with a better explanation than a, a big bang. How many have ever read that? I mean, I have actually read it in some of It's the big bang. <laughs> That's what happened. You know, I, I, I can just see these scientists sitting around, you know. And, 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 and someone's got that funny hair you know. You know what I'm saying? They sat around, they're scratching their head, they're looking at one another and everything. And, and one comes up, well, I've got the answer. How does it happen? It's, it's the big bang. <laughs> and they all said, oh, goody, goody. He come up with the explanation. It's the big bang, you know. I think Einstein would even laugh about that. The big bang. You know, God put faith in people's hearts to believe. I believe there was faith there to believe too, but you know what happened? They pushed it aside because of their attitude against this man, Jesus. He didn't come the way that they think he should have come. He didn't dress the way they thought he should dress. He didn't act like they thought he should act. They didn't like John the Baptist, and they sure didn't like Jesus. You see what I'm saying? It didn't matter what he spoke. It didn't matter what he did. Come on. It didn't matter the miracles that he performed. It didn't matter the glorious words that he spoke. They just didn't like him. He didn't like him. So you know what? Since they did not like him, they rejected him. He could have been right there when he fed the multitudes, and they would have still rejected him. That's what unbelief will do. If you let it reside in you, it's like a root of bitterness. 
if you don't deal with the bitterness, that root of bitterness in you, it will become hatred yes. and it will destroy you. Yes. That, that root of bitterness will grow up in you and you will begin to hate the person that put that root of bitterness in that you allow for it to start in you. Yeah. Hatred's got to come from something. I've said before, nobody backslides overnight. It's a slow process. But over time, over time, because maybe somebody got hurt in church or maybe somebody said something that somebody didn't like or didn't like this person or didn't like that person, something happened that, that you know, that you got, uh, you got your little feelings hurt. Well, bless God, I'm not going back because of this or because of that or the preacher didn't shake my hand or, or somebody looked funny at me and all these kind of stupid excuses people have. You know what's happening? You're letting a root of bitterness grow up in you. You know what it's going to do? Wind up destroying you. And that's what happened here. They let their unbelief destroy them because they did not like Jesus. He didn't come the way that he was supposed to have come in their minds. He was a wine bearer, a drunk, and he was a sinner, a breaker of the Sabbath day. They didn't wash his hands before he ate. They couldn't open anything they could to keep people from receiving him. Does that make any sense to you? In other words, they had an attitude. It didn't matter what the testimony of the man that was eyes were opened. It didn't matter what the mom and the dad said. It didn't matter what the, what the people, amen, the neighbors said or those that knew him. It didn't matter. It, wouldn't, it didn't matter. <clears throat> they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Uh -huh. Here's a man... That was born blind. That yeah. God had opened his eyes. Yeah. But yet, the hardness of these people's heart was so hard. He said, you were born a sinner. Well, they were too. You know what I'm saying? They were too. But they recognized themselves as being righteous and him being a sinner. So they cast him out of the synagogue. They cast him out of the church. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? I'll ask you today, do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said to him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I am coming to this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Now he's speaking of a spiritual thing. Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. They only seen, you know how far they seen? The tip of their nose, that's it. They never seen beyond that. They didn't see the power of God. They didn't see the grace of God. They didn't see the love of God. They didn't see nothing but their own religious attitude. And it destroyed them. It took them away. Amen. Obviously, unbelief is a horrible condition. But I believe that we can destroy it. I believe we can combat it. I believe God give us the power to overcome our unbelief. You know, and, and one of the greatest prayers that we can ever say to God is, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to be a real believer and have faith in everything, God. Help me to believe in Jesus' name. There's always going to be those of a religious spirit and a religious attitude. You know, that, I mean, there's the Pharisees are still among us today. The Sadducees are among us today. The same religious demons that were in possession of these people's hearts and minds, they're still active today. They're still out here today. They're looking down on others. They're, they, you know, in other words, they have a, a, an attitude of, of not righteousness, but self-righteousness. They're better than anyone else. They give you that impression. 
Amen. When you greet them and try to greet them in a marketplace sometimes, you can tell them that the spirit is something wrong with their attitude. There's something wrong with their spirit. There's something wrong with the way that they conduct themselves. It is, a, it is unbelief operating in their lives. And it's called a spirit. I mean, a lot of people call it a, a religious spirit. A religious spirit is that one that I first started out with. That's the make-believer that has a religious spirit. They love church. They love to be religious. They love to be uh, looked upon as uh, a godly person, you know. And if they give and they, they do these things and they worship and they do all the actions, I mean, of, 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 of religion. But what it is, it's a spirit that's not from God. It's a spirit that is born within them, amen. And when truth comes their way, truth is the divider, right? Amen, understand that. When truth comes, amen, those that have the right spirit, amen, will rejoice in the truth, amen. They will rejoice in the power of God, the love of God, the truth of God's word. Even though it cuts, amen, even though it hurts, even though maybe sometimes we get our toes stepped on. How many knows that that happens a lot of times under the preaching, amen? We get convicted, amen, if we're going the wrong way or doing the wrong thing or have the wrong attitude, amen. Well, I thank God, amen, that there are some men and women of God that don't mind telling us the truth. Amen. My God, give me the truth. If I'm doing something wrong, going the wrong way, help me out here. Amen. Help me out a little bit. Amen. If I'm walking along and I'm blind, I'm about to walk off in a big ditch somewhere. Say something to me. Don't let me destroy myself. And that's what preaching is all about. That's what lifting one another up is all about. It's helping one another. Amen. 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 A lot of them was because of their traditions. They love the traditions of religion. You know, the, the trappings of, uh, of all the different things. Uh, you know, and I hate to put it this way, but it's true. You know, people are more religious. And they, they, they go to church more on, 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 on Easter. <laughs> Easter, you know, everybody, all the church looking forward to Easter. Not because it's the uh, resurrection of Christ, but some people don't come to the church. <laughs> and we'll have us a winning roast. We'll have us an egg hunt. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we're we, we all going to dress up. Yeah. And for one day a year, we're going to appear religious yes. before all the people. Everybody has their Easter clothes to buy. Yeah. Buy the little children all the little dresses and cute little outfits and yeah. stuff like that. I had them when I was a kid. You know? But it doesn't help anybody. It's just religious trappings. I mean, what in the world has an Easter egg and a bunny rabbit got to do with the resurrection of Christ? Absolutely zilch. Zero. But we're gonna be we're gonna be we're gonna be in church on Easter. Come blank and blank for water. <laughs> we're going to be there. And then Christmas, oh, we're going to be there. As long as church is not on Christmas Day, we'll be there. <laughs> Y'all looking funny at me, but it's the truth. That's a religious spirit. Listen, Jesus don't intend for us just to worship him one day a week or two days a year. He wants us to worship him every day of our lives. He wants us to get up in the morning. Put on the Lord Jesus. Amen. Give yourself to God. Worship the Lord. Pray. Start your day out right. It's an every day. He said take up the cross daily. Not twice a year. But Jesus told us that your traditions has made the word of God of none effect to you. That's what Jesus told us. I've got the scripture right here. Amen. He said, here's the way that Jesus put it. And this is in Matthew 15. You don't have to turn because I'm just going to quote a few scriptures from this. But you can read it. If you read your Bible, you will read it anyway. You probably have already. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother, and he that cursed his father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, whosoever say to his father and mother, uh, it is a gift by whatsoever Thou mightest be profited by me. Thou honor not his father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God a none effect by your tradition. They actually changed the word of God, said, to fit their attitude. To fit their attitude. 
Jesus said, if a man looketh upon a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. That word has never changed. Amen. It doesn't matter because you got something wrote on the wall and said, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's written in your hearts. It's in our hearts. If you're a born again Christian, God writes it in your heart. You don't have to read the Ten Commandments to know when that thou shalt not commit adultery. You understand what I'm saying? It's written in your heart. God put it in your heart. Not just on a table of stone. Not just on some kind of a, a do's and don'ts that the church gives you to follow after. But it's by the traditions. We uphold traditions more than we do the Word of God. And a lot of times. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Thou shalt not. A religious, <laughs> amen, a religious <laughs> attitude, a religious spirit. Amen. 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 Lord, help me, Jesus. Jesus told the Galatian church, he said, you observe days and months and years and times. He said, I'm afraid of you. It's in Galatians chapter 4. I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He told them, he said, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. We should never forget, and we've got to understand, you are saved by grace and not by works, lest any man should boast. Amen. But I'll tell you what, if you are saved by his grace, grace is going to teach you to deny ungodliness and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There's a teaching there that's applied by the Holy Spirit of the living God. And that Holy Spirit of God is in you, guiding you and leading you and teaching you into the ways of righteousness, true righteousness. True righteousness. It's not a church standard that you're living by. But it's the word of God itself applied to your heart that you're living by. Right. Amen. 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 How many loves the Lord? Yes. Amen. And then I, I, I wrote this note to me about this chapter here. Can you imagine that whole chapter now? That whole chapter just on the dealing with the attitude. Letting, God letting us know the attitude of the people then. That we would not fall into that same snare. Hebrews 3 and 12 says, Take heed, brother, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The Bible says, It was because of your unbelief that Jesus was not able to do a miracle among his own people, his kindred, because of their unbelief. It hinders, it hinders the move of God in your life. It hinders you to being blessed. It hinders what God wants to do for you. I, I, I can stand before you this morning and say that I have limited God zillions of times in my own life. You know, I have. I've limited God. I didn't know God was as big and as good as he is. I don't know why I didn't know that. Well, I just didn't do that. There's, there's no take the limitations off God. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be prospered. God wants you to will. It's God's will. It's God's desire for you to live a healthy life, a good life, a prosperous life, and have happiness. You realize you can go through all the sins, the moral sin in particular, the sin of the Bible, and you look at those moral sins that God said, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, stop that, don't do that. They're just not laws because God wants to prove that he's God, so well, you're going to do this because I'm God. No, they're, they're laws to help you. They're laws to preserve you. To preserve your family, to preserve your marriage, to preserve your relationship with your children, with parents, and, and with your neighbors. There, there are laws there intended for you to build you up and to bless you and to help you and to prosper you. That's how good God is. That's how good God is. His laws are for you, and they are for me, that I might be prospered in this life that I'm living. Amen. Amen. There's a scripture here, it's in Matthew 9, 24, and this is the father of a child that was sick. 
And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Remember I mentioned being honest. We need to be honest with God. And, let, and say, God, help me with my unbelief. Lord, I want to take the limitations off you. Yeah. I want to take it off my finances. I want to take it off of, you know, the fact where I doubt sometimes whether I can really live for you or not live for you. Sometimes I doubt maybe I'm going to fall or maybe I'm not going to make it. i got to take all that off. Amen. And realize that, Lord, you're able to keep me from falling. Right. You're able to present me faultless before your throne of glory. Amen. You're able to preserve me. <laughs> And God, when my heart condemned me, you're greater than my heart. Don't you see how good God is? He just wants us to believe him. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't be a Sadducee. Don't have a bad attitude. Trust God. And if we would trust him, give ourselves to him. I'm telling you, there's no limit to what you can do in your life for God. Whether you've got a hundred more years to live, or what you've got 40 years or 20 years to live. How much time we've got on this earth if we just trust God? Take the limitations off God. There's no telling what God will do for us. Amen. And in Romans 4 and 20, he's talking about Abraham here. Amen. The father of faith, he's called. And in Romans 4 and 20, he says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And I say, don't stagger, don't waver, don't doubt. Trust God that greater things are ahead for you and ahead for I. It doesn't matter. And I've said this in, in the next two trumpet messages coming out. You may have already gotten one of them. In those trumpet messages, I'm telling people, I'm saying, look, it doesn't matter who the president of the United States is. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has all the power in heaven and earth. My God, he, he can, listen, he can keep you in the times of tribulation and trouble. My God, he can supply all of your needs through his riches and glory. He still can still create miracles and do what? Listen, he can multiply your life. He can multiply the fishes of the Lord. He can multiply whatever you need in this life. He can give it to you. He can bless you in the times of famine. He can bless you in the times of trouble. He can bless you when the whole economy is flat as a flitter and going down. You can be blessed. Right. Remember when the gas prices went up, I paid over five dollars. Now, well, I was in Oklahoma. We went at over five dollars. We paid for diesel out there in Oklahoma, over five dollars a gallon. This has been what in 08 maybe. I can't remember. 07 or 08, you know, when it really got, got crazy and the stock market was going nutty and all this kind of stuff, people were scared. People, one man in the church I preached at, I forgot how much money. You remember how much money that man lost in the stock market? 100000 100000 is that all? I thought it was a lot more than that. Of course, people, us men are exaggerating anyway. But anyway, but, then, you know, but I mean, listen, who lost over $100,000 in the stock market? He should have been playing the stock market in the first place. Might as well be a gambler. Anyway. <laughs> so, but listen. Listen. God can bless you in the time of trouble. Yes, He can. He can sustain you. He can, and he will. So you say praise the Lord. He will. Okay, now here's what a believer does, and I'll close with this. He wrote this to Timothy, but it's a good lesson for all of us. He said, be thou an example of the believers. And listen, now listen, be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continuing them, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That's what believers are supposed to be doing. 
We're supposed to be building one another up, encouraging one another, living a life before one another that encourages us to live that same life. Amen? Not going the opposite way, but living a life. Amen. That would be an example to these young people, to this child, and to some of this old folks. I need to see you living for God. You know why? Because it encourages me. I need to see you when you go through a trial, and you go through a storm in your life, and you go through a heartbreak, and you go through, you know, a, a rough spot in your life. And, and, and I need to, not to, uh, that I enjoy seeing that, but I see, enjoy seeing the other side that you've come through with a smile on your face and a praise in your lips. But you're still serving God. It encourages me. How many of you can say the same? It encourages you to know somebody is pressing on. All right, let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus.